everyone. Thank you so much, Kath, for doing a master class and walking us through the many issues that the Pentagon faces right now from China to Russia to the ongoing cyber attacks and the critical internal transformation that you're leading. So we're very excited to have you in this seat. And thank you so much for joining us. And also thank you, Helene, for really insightful and thoughtful questions. Without further ado, we are now moving to our next and final session. I know we have Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, joining us. He is just in the process of getting in our green room behind the scenes. And we have Jerry Seib from the Wall Street Journal here to interview him. Let me just, while we're getting Jake online, let me just do a little bit of an introduction of him. Many of you, of course, are familiar with Jake Sullivan. He is currently the assistant to the president for national security affairs after having already a distinguished career in government. Previously, he served as the national security advisor for Vice President Joe Biden. And before that, he was the director of policy planning at the US Department of State and the Deputy Chief of Staff um, to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And of course, as many of you know, and many of you worked with him, he also was the Senior Policy Advisor for Secretary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Jake clerked for Judge Stephen Breyer on the Supreme Court and Judge Guido Calabresi of the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. So he's really an underachiever. <laughs> and all of us who've known him for a long time also know that he is an incredibly kind and approachable person. Let me pause here right before I introduce Jerry and just make sure that we have Jake. Hi, Anya, can you hear me? Hey, yes, I can. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. And, and Jake, you have an enormous portfolio, of course, and you are serving a president who has made really bold promises about transforming our foreign policy. Uh, we've heard already, you weren't able to be on, of course, but we heard earlier in the sessions from Steve Began and Tom Donilon, there was remarkable agreement between them on the challenges that the U.S. faces and how to handle them. Kath Hicks focused on China's capabilities, competing effectively with China, and said actually that um, she thinks the U.S. military was, will be a supporting player uh, to the diplomatic and other tools there. You have Iran, where we understand indirect talks are underway. Uh, the president has said he's gonna be tough on dictators and has already launched two rounds of sanctions against the Russians while saying we're gonna find ways to work together. And of course, uh, the administration is talking about ending the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. We had President Ashraf Ghani here with us at Aspen a couple of months ago. And of course, that's you know not the outcome he would have preferred now. But so we look forward to hearing from you on all of those issues. Here to, to talk to you about each of these issues is Jerry Seib, who is a distinguished journalist and the executive Washington editor of the Wall Street Journal, where he writes the weekly Capital Journal column. He, of course, also reported from the Middle East earlier in his career and has covered the White House and has won more journalistic awards than we can mention here. So without further ado, uh, Jerry and Jake, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jake, good to almost be with you again. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm on here. I can see you, Jerry. Great. Uh, really okay. happy to be here uh, Excellent. And, and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. You know, Jake, as I thought about this conversation today, um, it occurred to me that I might ask whether at the 100 days mark, and this is the 100th day mark, you could articulate a Biden doctrine in foreign policy. And then it occurred to me that we know what the Biden doctrine is. The president has told us it's a foreign policy for the middle class. So the question really is, what does that mean? What does that foreign policy for the middle class mean? And what's different about it from what we've seen over the years? Well, uh, first of all, Jerry, it's great to be with you. Anya, uh, you're overly generous introduction. Thank you for that, but especially thank you for your leadership uh, at the Aspen Strategy Forum and all the work that you've done um, to pull together just an incredible group of speakers, leaders, thinkers uh, to grapple with a very difficult set of issues. And when you were walking through the set of challenges that 
we're up against. I um, was sort of reflecting back on a hundred sleepless nights uh, because there is a big world out there and it's a, a number of significant uh, threats and challenges for us to grapple with that we'll get the chance to talk about. With respect to the foreign policy for the middle class, I would just start with a kind of basic proposition that President Biden measures the efficacy of everything that we are doing in our foreign policy, our conduct abroad, our relationships, uh, our engagements, our choices about military deployment based on whether or not it is going to make life better, safer, easier for working families in the United States. Now, that's a kind of an obvious statement, but it bears restating, which is why uh, from his perspective that he wants everyone to be quite explicit about the centrality of working in middle-class families to the decisions that he is making in our foreign policy. So that's at, at kind of the basic level. In addition to that then, as we think about the challenge of China, uh, or as we think about how we rack and stack significant threats, um, that metric has actual real world consequences. It means that climate and COVID and cyber all have to be uh, significant priorities in our foreign policy because of their direct impact on people here, significant and direct impact on people here in the United States. And then when it comes to the US-China relationship, our focus in the economic domain, in the technology domain, and in the diplomatic domain is in ensuring uh, that we are holding China accountable to play by the rules so that American workers, American businesses, American families uh, are not undermined uh, or harmed by China's practices or conduct. And so that has an impact on, on how we approach US-China policy, which I'm sure we'll get into further as, as this conversation goes on. So, Foreign policy for the middle class is a is a concept. I would not call it the Biden doctrine. Um, you know, I would say it is an important element of the approach that the president has laid out, uh, and uh, what I've just kind of described uh, is is kind of my best effort to distill uh, in practice uh, how it impacts the decision making that the president is pursuing in the foreign policy domain. Well, and as you said, China is central to that. So let's go there next. Um, it, it is a, China is a competitor and it is a more aggressive competitor. I think we see what China is doing on technology transfer, on technology theft, on trade in the South China Sea, on Taiwan, um, and on internal dissent. Um, I guess the question is why? Why do you think we are looking at a more aggressive China, a more aggressive posture that preceded you know, your entry into office in this administration? Um, why do you think that that's the case now? And what did you take away from the Alaska meeting that helped you perhaps uh, answer that question? Well, our assessment is that the Chinese government has made a few determinations uh, over the last five years or so, uh, and those determinations are guiding their foreign policy. First, that the hide and bide strategy should be shelved in favor of a much more aggressive and assertive posture in terms of their military deployment uh, and their intimidation and coercion of neighbors uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so they made that determination in part because they felt that their capabilities had grown and in part because their patience had lessened to hide and bide. Second, uh, they made a determination to shift increasingly in the direction of state control in their economy. Uh, and that uh, was a determination driven by a sense of a political model, an autocratic political model that emphasizes control and centralization. And then third, they made a determination uh, to take aggressive action in their, within uh, this, this, the sovereign territory of China uh, uh, to try to um, exercise that control on the political side as well. And, and we saw that in their uh, crushing of dissent in Hong Kong. We see it in their uh, egregious activities in Xinjiang uh, and in other places as well. And so those are choices China has made. And it is up to the United States and other members of the international community, including our allies and partners, to determine how we respond to that. 
And the goal is not to contain China. It's not to start a new Cold War. It's not to get into conflict. As the president said, it's to compete vigorously and to push back uh, in service of our values and what we believe to be universal values. And that is the policy that we are conducting now. And, and why specifically become so aggressive on Taiwan right now? And what do you do in response? How do you respond firmly without being provocative uh, on Taiwan? Look, I can't um, give you uh, a, an authoritative account of what is driving the PLA decision-making or Xi Jinping's decision-making on incursions into the air defense identification zone of Taiwan, et cetera, we could say broadly is uh, that Xi Jinping as president of China has made the Taiwan issue and the need to increase pressure on Taiwan a central feature of their foreign policy. Uh, I think he regards it as, as critical to uh, Chinese prestige and stability over the long term. Um, and the American position on this is quite straightforward. We believe in uh, the one China policy, that uh, the full implementation of the Taiwan Relations Act, the six assurances, in that we stand in, uh, you know, we, we continue in the footsteps of bipartisan uh, um, consensus in US China policy going back decades, Democratic administrations, Republican administrations. And we oppose unilateral changes to the status quo. What we would like to see is stability and cross-strait relations and uh, no effort to uh, unilaterally change the status quo. We have communicated that to China. We have affirmed that with uh, Taiwan. We have affirmed that with our partners, including when Prime Minister Suga was here in Washington for a summit with the president. And that is how we are going to continue to approach the Taiwan issue going forward with steadiness and clarity and resolve uh, with respect to our view that um, there should be no unilateral changes to the status quo. And do you perceive a need at the moment to do more in a uh, concrete sense to help Taiwan resist aggression from China? I believe that we need to continue our obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act to uh, provide uh, defensive assistance to Taiwan so that they have the tools and capabilities they need from a self-defense perspective. I believe that we also need uh, to elevate our concerns uh, with other countries in the Indo-Pacific so that not just the United States, but others are speaking out about the need for stability and cross-strait relations. Uh, and I believe that we need to continue to deepen our people-to-people -people ties to Taiwan uh, in terms of economics and uh, education and um, the work between two fellow democracies. I mean, Taiwan's uh, performance on COVID-19 is downright remarkable and deserves to be studied and they deserve to be consulted with on that issue. Taiwan's approach to issues like disinformation and uh, the, the dealing with the challenge of social media is quite remarkable. And we have a lot to learn from that as well. Taiwan is a vibrant democracy. Um, and so across a number of different issue areas, the United States should be standing up in support of Taiwan and not to try to escalate or alter uh, the status quo across the strait, but rather to, to do what two fellow democracies do, which is try to work together to solve significant problems. So two areas where engagement with China is inevitable, and when one it's already happened, they're climate change and trade. So let me just ask you about those two in turn quickly. On climate change, uh, there has been a conversation. There is engagement. Um, the question I have is whether you believe China is serious about engaging and acting on climate change in, union, in unison with us, or are we being used by the Chinese, um, as some of your Republican friends um, insist? Well, let me take the second part of that first. Well, <laughs> Would China like to get away with doing as little as possible on this, like many other countries would like to get away with doing as little as possible? Probably, you know, so we can't come at this issue thinking, um, well, you know, this is all just gonna work out fine. That's number one. Number two, um, we are not in the business of treating cooperation with China on climate change as a favor that Beijing is doing for the United States. We do not see it that way. 
we think action on climate change, change is a fundamental responsibility of every significant country in the world. And we think action on climate change is fundamentally in the interests of every significant country in the world, including China. So it's no favor to us. We're not gonna trade something else off against it. We're not gonna concede in other domains in, in order to elicit cooperation from China on climate change. Those are choices they're gonna to have to make as a country. Uh, and, and based on what they do or don't do, we will take action accordingly. So I don't accept the critique that somehow suggests we're holding hostage the rest of our policy to climate. Climate is a massive priority for the president and for the United States as well it should be, but it, it is not at odds with in any way our uh, capacity or intention to counter China in the areas where we believe we have to do so. On the question of whether they're really prepared to cooperate in a big way, the jury is very much out. Frankly, uh, we have made clear, and the president laid this out in detail at the summit that he hosted of the major countries of the world on climate here at the White House last week, that the 2020s are the critical decade to take action. And simply an objective look at China's plan to date um, suggests that their main lines of effort are really backloaded as opposed to frontloaded. Uh, Secretary Kerry has been working closely with them. I don't want to opine further on the nature of that because I think we need intensive diplomacy and that's best conducted behind closed doors. But the, the jury is out because of the way that they have designed their pledge um, to put less emphasis on the near term and more on the long term. And obviously we've asked every country to really look at the next, next decade as the critical decade. You know, trade, uh, when do you envision engaging with the Chinese on trade and what should we think the future is for those tariffs that President Trump imposed on China? We are, uh, first of all, I think five weeks into having a US trade representative. Of course, we're 100 days into the administration, but uh, Ambassador Tai was only confirmed a little more than a month ago. Uh, our Commerce Secretary was confirmed around the same time. They are still filling out their teams. Um, and of course, we are in the priority one business right now of making major investments here at home in the United States, first through the American Recovery Plan, and then through trying to advance the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan in Congress. So that's where our, our effort and, and priority lie while Ambassador Tai, Secretary Raimondo, Secretary Yellen, the rest of our team engage with allies and partners around the world on a kind of common understanding of the economic challenge posed by China and trade challenge posed by China and then common strategy for how to deal with that. So it's going to take some time before we are engaged directly with China in a negotiation over uh, trade issues and because we are gonna to wanna to finalize a, a pattern of deep consultation with other countries before we do so. Uh, and complete a deep study of what we see as the impacts of the tariffs that are currently on the books. And it's not just the tariffs, of course, Jerry, as you know, it's questions related to technology controls. Uh, it's issues related to other trade tools and remedies that we have available to us. And so we are working on all of that. Um, and I don't have a particular time frame to lay out for you, only to tell you that, um, that we still need, we are, we have, patience and we are going to be systematic in how we approach this um, with the first priority being increasing our position of strength here at home. So let's turn to that other um, newly aggressive actor or continuously aggressive actor on the world stage um, of Vladimir Putin um, and Russia. Will there be an early summer summit between President Biden and President Putin? We are actively discussing that issue. I, in fact, spoke with my counterpart, the Russian National Security Advisor, this morning. Um, we are uh, trying to make plans for a summit this summer in a third country in Europe. No date has been fixed. No location has been fixed, but uh, it's actively under discussion. And uh, President Biden has indicated in his conversations with President Putin and publicly, he believes that uh, such a summit would be valuable in establishing better understandings uh, between our two countries and the possibility of getting this relationship on a more stable, predictable path. And the president's also made clear that Ukraine, and this is an obvious point, would be near the top of the list on the agenda for such a meeting. Um, 
again, I'm going to ask you to put yourself in the mind of a foreign leader. What was President Putin up to um, on the border of Ukraine over the last few weeks, um, moving in and moving out? What's the signal to be sent to Ukraine? What's the signal that's meant to be sent to you? You know, this is one of those cases, Jerry, where I'm going to uh, very directly not answer the question because, and and the reason why is honestly because uh, first, I think there are multiple reasons, but secondly, I think me laying out why Putin was doing what Putin was doing is would not be helpful uh, to the engagement that we have uh, going with the Russians. We uh, have taken note of the fact that they have uh, pulled an, a significant amount of their forces back off the border and returned them to their home bases. This is a constructive step. And uh, I, I want to leave it at that because our goal here, particularly where it comes to Ukraine, is to be vigilant and, and public and unabashed in saying that we support and stand up for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, but then to use high-level private diplomatic channels to communicate with the Russians about how we manage this situation going forward alongside consultations with the the Germans, the French, and and other key actors in the diplomacy around Ukraine. So to use a Joe Biden-like phrase, I think the president has tried to signal that he has Ukraine's back. How do you show that? How do you show that to the Ukrainians? How do you show that publicly? Um, What kind of steps are involved in reassuring the the Ukrainian government at this point that Joe Biden has their back? I think there are three main categories to this. The first is that we have an ongoing uh, security relationship with Ukraine where we provide defensive articles uh, to them uh, and some forms of training. The second is an economic relationship in which uh, we work with the IMF and others to try to bring about significant economic reform within Ukraine, but also help them have a measure of economic stability that will uh, end up providing benefits to the Ukrainian people. And then the third is diplomatic, uh, not just our direct diplomatic engagement with Ukraine and with Ukrainian people, uh, but our engagement across Europe um, to uh, have a range of countries standing together with us in defense of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. We believe that we can do all of these things uh, and be resolute and firm while at the same time very much supporting uh, resolution of the conflict, diplomatic progress, de-escalation, uh, all in service of ultimately producing uh, an outcome from the Minsk process uh, that finally fully uh, resolves what is an ongoing conflict uh, in Eastern Ukraine. Is there a conversation underway about the potential for sending Ukraine some additional defensive military equipment, equipment they could absorb quickly in the event of a crisis? Uh, well, I said we have an ongoing security relationship. We're, uh, there's not discussion of doing something out of stride, but in stride, the United States has fielded requests from the Ukrainians in the past and supplied them. We'll field requests in the future and and. Um, you know, be willing to provide uh, certain types of materiel. Um, so uh, that, that's an ongoing dialogue that we have between our uh, security teams and their security teams. Um, but also, Jerry, I just want to take a step back uh, on the broader issue because, uh, you know, what, what we have seen over the course of the first 100 days in the U.S.-Russia relationship, I think, um, has been... President Biden basically being very clear from the outset what he intended to do and then following through on doing it. And and I think that that bears noting. So he basically said, look, first, um, we're going to stand up in defense of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of our partners, um, and we're going to be firm about that. And, And he's done that with respect to Ukraine. He will continue to do so. Second, he said, if Russia takes harmful actions against the United States and our intelligence community determines that they are responsible, we will respond, and he did that. Third, he said, we will work with Russia where it's in our interest to do so. And in the first 15 days, we extended the New START Treaty on nuclear weapons by five years uh, without qualification. And then fourth, he said, overall, overall, his goal with Russia is actually to put this relationship on a more stable, predictable, effective footing. And he believes leader level engagement is critical for that. He's talked to Putin twice by phone and looks forward to meeting with him in person. 
for me, this is um, a hallmark of President Biden's overall approach to foreign policy. It's principled, it's pragmatic, it's rooted in personal engagement with leaders, and it is, uh, it, it comes, it's three-dimensional. It's not just all one thing or all another. It's trying to manage a complex and difficult relationship in a way that stays true to American interests. I know that wasn't directly your question, but I actually think for the audience, understanding how he's approached Russia in the first 100 days tells you a, a fair amount about how he's looking at U.S. foreign policy over the course of the next four years. Jake, can you can you hear me and see me? Jake, I think you're muted and we okay. may yes. There you go. Uh, I'm here. Sorry, I pushed put myself on mute and couldn't unmute. So yes, Nick, I could hear and see you, and Anya, I can hear you. Good. I think we've lost Jerry just for a moment. I apologize, but uh, we're just going to filibuster here and continue to ask you questions um, as before we get Jerry back. Um, I certainly just wanted to ask you a question about NATO. Um, I've been impressed by what the president, Secretary Blinken, and you have been doing to strengthen it. And to, and in general, to build up the power of our alliances as we seek to contain uh, Russia and compete with China. Can you talk about both your East-West strategy and our alliances? Sure. Um, so first, uh, Nick, it's great to see you. And um, I'm hoping at some point here, you'll be responsible for all of our problems and for solving them. Um, second, um, the uh, president has committed actually to going to Brussels in June for a NATO summit. And the, kind of, the, the central question at that summit is what does the next 10 years of NATO look like? We had a strategic concept in 2010. Uh, you know, we're now uh, a decade on from that and it's time to look at a strategic concept for the next decade. And, and, and that is about reinforcing the basic foundations of NATO, starting with Article 5, uh, starting with collective defense and interoperability and burden sharing and all the principles that have guided NATO through the decades. But then it's also about retooling the alliance for the challenges of the future. That includes uh, a much more effective approach alliance-wide on cyber, where you know we face considerable threats from both Russia and China. It means having NATO think about uh, partnerships, um, not just on the periphery of Europe or in the Middle East or in South Asia, but in the Indo-Pacific as well. Uh, um, you know, not to extend the formal alliance, but rather to conceive of security in a much more holistic global way. Uh, it means thinking about cha uh, security challenges that don't fall in the military domain at all, uh, whether it is disinformation or uh, it is corruption as a, as a foreign policy weapon, and, and how NATO as an alliance begins to conceive of the nature of security um, beyond the very tight, effective military uh, uh, cooperation and engagement that has been the hallmark and the, and the kind of fundamental identity of NATO in the past. So that's what we are working towards. Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin have both uh, spent a considerable amount of time with their counterparts on this, I with mine, and President Biden, there will be a culmination of that when he goes to the summit. The last thing that I will say on this is NATO has been central to the Resolute Support Mission in Afghanistan, and um, the, the President's decision to end the American military presence there was a coordinated decision with all of our NATO allies that we were in together, we'll be out together, and we are currently um, working hand in hand on a military drawdown that is combined with a common strategy around our continuing diplomatic development, humanitarian intelligence, uh, and security partnership uh, with the Afghan government going forward. So that will also be high on the agenda come June um, even as we're kind of looking out to the future uh, to great power challenges and, and other non-traditional threats. Thank you. And, and Jake, it's been, it's been equally interesting to see um, your focus, the president's focus, the administration's focus on our Indo-Pacific allies and partners. 
Uh, Steve Began was on earlier this morning on this program. He's still with us. Steve pointed out that President Trump revived the Quad, and I think you have to give the Trump administration credit for that. But President Biden has taken it to a place it's never been before, a head of government summit. Do you believe that the Quad can be an effective uh, limit on China's egregious behavior in the Indo-Pacific? First of all, absolutely credit where credit is due. I mean, the Quad was, was invented uh, actually in the Bush administration in, in the wake of the, the Asian tsunami. Uh, it uh, continued under the Obama administration, but really was boosted and elevated in a significant way under the Trump administration and the, the notion of a free and open Indo-Pacific. And it was upon that platform that we built uh, the first leaders level summit uh, that took place a few weeks ago. Um, we believe that the Quad is um, an incredible platform for four highly capable democracies to deal with a range of challenges from COVID to climate, to disaster relief, to maritime security, um, and to help set the rules of the road uh, on everything from cyber and emerging technology uh, to freedom of navigation. Um, what I would say about the China piece of it is what was so interesting about the summit is yes, of course they talked about China and the challenge posed by China. But in a way, what makes the Quad so effective is that the Quad is not fundamentally about China. It's about this affirmative agenda that these four capable democracies can set. And the outcome of that, not the point of it, but the outcome of it is uh, to create a, a better context and atmosphere for managing China's uh, uh, behavior, activities, aggression in effective ways. I know that sounds a little like Diplo speak, but it's really important uh, that we think about these kinds of partnerships, whether it's USEU or it's Quad or it's NATO, as not being fundamentally aimed at another country, but rather aimed at a theory of the international system that is rooted in uh, rules-based, values-based, uh, uh, humane approaches. And if we do that work, then our collective capacity to deal with China, to deal with Russia, to deal with other countries will be much greater. That's how we think about it. And, and that to me is the difference between a two-dimensional kind of, we're just going at this other country and a three-dimensional approach uh, where the, the practical result of it will be uh, that we are in a better position to manage the challenges and the competition that we face from China. Right. Thank you so much, Jake. We've got Jerry back. I think he lost power briefly. And Jerry, in your absence, we've talked about NATO and we've covered the quad. So we'll let you take back over from here. Thanks. Great, thank you. I, you know, I, if I was a conspiracy theorist, I wonder why I was lost, but it actually the wind, the gale force winds here knocked the power out ever so briefly here. So anyway, fingers crossed. Um, and because Nick is really smart, he stole my question on the quad. So I won't have to ask that one. Um, there is a kind of a broader question, though, Jake, um, about both the, the China and, and Russia relationship. And this is something you and I have talked about a bit in the past, which is um, how great is the danger here that particularly on the Chinese side um, that the they start to believe the narrative that they tell themselves, which is that the West and the U.S. in particular are in a state of decline and inevitable and long decline and therefore the field is more open to them um, and that they miscalculate as a result of that. That could be true for the Russians or the Chinese or others as far as that's concerned. How great a danger is that in your mind? I think you put your finger on what is one of the fundamental dynamics facing the world today, uh, which is the question that China is asking, Russia is asking, but frankly, so is the rest of the world. Um, is the United States in particular, but the West in general uh, on the way down? And you heard from President Biden on Wednesday night in his address to the nation, uh, his laser focus on the issue of whether democracies can deliver in a time of profound change and upheaval, whether they can deliver economically, whether they can deliver political cohesion, whether they can deliver against everything from COVID-19 to uh, technological change. And his answer to that question is they absolutely can if we put in the work and this next decade will be decisive as historians look back um, to uh, providing a positive answer to the question, can democracies deliver? And he's really 
focused on that as one of the central organizing principles of his presidency. And that's why foreign policy is domestic policy and domestic policy is foreign policy because our capacity to reinforce the fundamental sources of American strength, our infrastructure, our innovation, uh, our democracy itself will be decisive in how we shape the perceptions of both competitors and adversaries on the one hand and allies and partners on the other hand. And I think we're off to a good start in the first 100 days. I think China is taking note of the fact that our projected growth rate now after the American recovery plan is 6.5% this year. They're taking note of the far reaching investments in infrastructure and innovation and R&D and education and, and American families that the president has laid out. They're taking note of the fact that we have been able to reinvigorate our alliances and, and elevate new groupings like the Quad. Uh, and I think it is making them think twice about how comfortable they can be simply sitting back and assuming the United States is on its way down. The last point I'll make on this is that uh, in Beijing, in capitals throughout the Indo-Pacific, Europe, and the rest of the world, there is a residual understanding that one of the great capacities of the United States that we've exercised repeatedly in the past is the capacity for renewal, regeneration, error correction, and that we can come back. Uh, we can, you know, we were flat on our backs on COVID a year ago, and now uh, we are um, on a very positive trajectory here at home and are turning to try to end this pandemic around the world and, and so much else. So. Um, you know, my view is that this is the central strategic question facing us, and our success depends on the kinds of investments that we can make and cohesion we can build here in the United States. And it's why as National Security Advisor, I concern myself so much with the work of the National Economic Council and Domestic Policy Council, uh, not because I'm just butting into other people's business, but because uh, it's our business too in national security. So I'm um, sorry for a long and somewhat animated answer to your question, but I think it's it's a really profoundly important subject. No, thank you for that. Um, let me just touch on a couple of other areas and then we'll open it up to audience questions. Uh, you won't be surprised I'm gonna ask you about Iran. Uh, how could I not? Um, two, twofold question here. Uh, are the Iranians negotiating in good faith in your estimation on the return to JCPOA? And are they showing willingness to talk about extending the life of the agreement, expanding it to include, include ballistic missiles and expanding it to include behavior beyond Iran's borders in the region? So I'm not gonna characterize the substance of the negotiations at this point because they're in a, um, a I would say a uh, sort of unclear place in Vienna, meaning that uh, we've seen willingness of all sides, including the Iranians to talk seriously about sanctions relief and nuclear restrictions uh, and a pathway back into the JCPOA, but um, it is still uncertain as to whether this will culminate in a deal in Vienna in the coming weeks. So while the diplomacy is ongoing and underway, I don't wanna get into the specifics of what's on the table and what's being negotiated and discussed. On the question of whether they're negotiating in good faith, uh, I guess good faith is always in the eye of the beholder. Uh, I believe the Iranians have come in a serious way to have serious discussions about details and the teams are working through those details now. Uh, and so this is not just, uh, you know, one side or the other giving the runaround. It's a, it's a real negotiation, albeit an indirect negotiation, which is more inefficient, of course. Um, whether it will result in a positive outcome or not remains to be determined. So final quick question from me, um, Afghanistan, you know, we, we know the president's decision on troop levels. What I'm curious about is how you would characterize the capability and capacity the U.S. will still have post uh, September in Afghanistan to deter um, terrorism and extremist activity, intelligence, special operations over their horizon projection forces. How robust will that capability be in the uh, wake of, of troop withdrawal? Well, as uh, members of the administration have testified, both in open session and, and behind closed doors on the Hill, it won't be the same capability, uh, but we believe it will be a sufficient capability, meaning that uh, between 
uh, what we can do in terms of uh, maintaining an intelligence picture uh, for the reemergence of a terrorist threat to the US homeland in Afghanistan, and then what we can maintain in terms of a military posture in the region to be able to respond if that threat does reemerge. Uh, we think that we can disrupt and suppress the threat uh, so that uh, it does not become an acute threat to the United States uh, or to American interests. That will include a number of arrangements with countries in the region. I don't want to go into specifics on that. Uh, it will include continued provision of security assistance to the Afghan National Security Forces directly. Uh, and it will include close cooperation and consultation with other partners who have been involved in the fight in Afghanistan from NATO and elsewhere who have their own capabilities that we will continue to rely upon. So. Um, we believe that we will be effectively postured to deal with this on a going forward basis, and that actually repositioning capabilities will put us in a better position overall to deal with the threat of terrorism writ large in the world, which as the president has pointed out, has become more di uh, dispersed and distributed across Africa, the Middle East, uh, and South Asia from where it stood 20 years ago when the United States went into Afghanistan in the first place. Jake, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the chance. Um, and I think Anya is going to step in uh, here and deal with uh, audience questions, of which I think there are already many. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jerry. And Jake, thanks for the tour de force around the world. We've got a number of people excited to ask you questions. We want to get you out of here on time, but I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and ask you the same thing that Jennifer Griffin asked Tom Donilon and Steve Began this morning. You've been there for 100 days. You said it's been a lot of sleepless nights, which we empathize with. What has been for you the most poignant or important or difficult day? Wow, um, that's, a, that's a hard question. I think um, uh, I don't have a good day. It was, you know, it's funny. <laughs> Um, uh, I was with a, a group of my team yesterday and someone posed a different version of this question, which was, you know, kind of the high low. What, what was your, your best, what's been the best moment in the first 100 days and the worst? And honestly, I couldn't come up with the best and I couldn't come up with the worst. Uh, and maybe that's just some kind of tragic Irish sensibility that, you know, we're just kind of doing our thing here. Um, I guess poignant um, uh, the, the thing that has hit me hardest emotionally, in a, and this is in a positive way, but also in kind of an epic way, was the president's speech on Wednesday night and listening to him from the dais uh, lay things out the way that he did, the culmination of 100 days of work, um, it, that, that kind of washed over me in, in kind of a profound and emotional way. Um, I am very proud of what we did with the Quad Summit. Uh, I thought that was a, just a significant moment that's really set us up for success going forward. Um, you know, we've had difficult days with attacks on air bases in Iraq that have led to the loss of life of Americans, uh, not service members, but contractors. And we had to choose, um, the president had to choose to take military action in response to that, that weighed heavily. Um, and then managing these great power relationships, both China and Russia, um, are uh, uh, kind of co require constant uh, focus and attention. But unfortunately, I think I'm giving you a very lame answer to your question about what the most poignant moment was. I promise at the 200 day mark, I'll have a better answer. No, it's a great answer. And you have a lot of accomplishments already under your belt for just 100 days in. So we hope from all of us that you get a little more sleep. Um, without further ado, let me turn first to Catherine Eng, who's one of our um, rising leaders, and she works in the tech industry. So Catherine, please. Hi, um, thanks for taking the time. Um, I'm Catherine. I've been working on APAC tech issues at Facebook. And prior to that, was lucky enough to work for Steve Hadley and Anya at RHGM. Um, my question is about digital sovereignty. 
uh, sovereignty today has acquired a digital dimension, and we certainly see that with China. Um, it also seems like the EU has its own digital sovereignty agenda in certain ways, like for example, with GDPR, it's great um, that, in, that it's empowering the individual to decide how a company uses its data, but some voices in the EU are calling for bolder antitrust policies, while other critics interpret this as erecting trade barriers against large um, foreign tech companies. Um, I think the outcomes of uh, this week's G7 digital ministerial are really encouraging, but given EU ambitions, how will the US work effectively with the EU on a potential multilateral tech policy framework when our approaches to data governance are kind of different and also at a time when we don't have a federal framework ourselves and we're trying to build stronger alliances to counter China? And how much does the EU's dependence on China as a market inhibit progress on cooperation? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, That's a big set of questions. Um, and uh, as a good um, manager of the interagency process in the U.S. government, I'm going to give a little bit of a process, process answer to it because there's a huge number of complex questions implicated in what you just laid out. Some differences of opinion between the U.S. and Europe on forms of digital regulation, but a lot of commonalities as well, including on questions related to the need for uh, effective antitrust and and pro-competition rules, uh, even if the details uh, we'll have to work through. So the way that we're looking at this is uh, building into the G7, as you mentioned, to uh, try to align around a set of principles and, and, and the, the tech G7 outcomes were a positive step in that direction. Second, the president will do a summit in Brussels uh, with the presidents of the European Union, the president of the commission, president of the council, um, and from that summit, our goal is uh, to structure uh, an effective dialogue on the whole range of trade and technology issues um, that will allow us to get onto the same page, both resolve disputes among us, but then develop a common strategy around our highest priority issues um, as it relates to reform of the international system and in certain cases, how to deal with um, the challenges posed by non-market economies like China. So that's what we intend. Um, those are gonna be some tough conversations, in some cases, some tough negotiations uh, where we try to come to a give and take on certain issues in, in the technology space. Uh, but I, our convergence dramatically outweighs our differences. And I think if we can manage those differences and resolve them effectively, through a structured dialogue, um, then we, our partnership together will put us in a position uh, to enhance the rules of the road in the digital space globally uh, for the benefit of all of our citizens. Thank you, Jake. Actually from Aspen Strategy Group in Munich is working on a project together that covers tech and Europe and what we can do together. So I'm glad you guys are focusing on it. Uh, can we go next to Joe Nye, please? Joe, are you there? Yes. Uh, hi, Jake. Um, I uh, would like to ask you about COVID. Uh, the Biden administration has done a great job on vaccinations, but we're not there yet. And yet at the same time, we're facing real emergencies in India, Brazil, and other countries. Uh, the administration has announced that it will export $60 million, uh, 60 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine when we deem it safe. But the emergency in India and Brazil is now. Is it plausible and possible that we could start exporting some of our own vaccines, uh, such as the Johnson & Johnson or the Moderna or, or the Pfizer, uh, even before we finished our full vaccinations at home? Uh, the argument for that is it would be good for us in the long run, good for our alliances, good for our soft power, but it poses political problems. What are the prospects for doing something like that? Joe, it's great to see you there. And I uh, should not have anticipated anything less than a very direct, very fair, very hard question to answer. 
Um, but what the president, first of all, the AstraZeneca doses are our own doses. Those are doses that, that we acquired and paid for for the purpose of using here. We've, of course, determined that we're unlikely to have or we're not going to have AstraZeneca as part of the mix. And so as soon as they're ready, we will send them. Uh, the president hasn't made a determination about sending additional doses at this moment, but he is very focused, and you heard him in the speech on Wednesday night, specifically refer to the need to become an, an important source of vaccines for the world. And so, uh, in fact, when I finish this conversation here in the next uh, little while, I'm going almost immediately into a meeting, um, which we are now holding on a regular basis for how to formulate our global COVID strategy, how to advance the provision of vaccines, the, the production first, and then provision of vaccines to the rest of the world. Uh, and we will have more to say on that subject in the not too distant future. I wish I could give you a better answer than that, but that's where things stand right now. Um, we are working through what our options are uh, and we're trying to do that expeditiously so that as soon as humanly possible, we'll be in a position to say, uh, we've got more to offer the world. That will be great. We look forward to that. Um, Jendai Frazier, I think we have you up next. Jendai was our Assistant Secretary for Africa and also Ambassador to South Africa. Thank you very much, Anya. And uh, it's a great pleasure. And I'm going to ask you, Jake, uh, Africa policy. It follows on Joe's. I promise you I was going to ask this even before Joe uh, spoke. But um, first, let me just say thank you for your leadership and two things that I think were critical for uh, US Africa, and that was the decision to approve Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala as the DG of the WTO, as well as the very strong and positive message that President Biden gave to the AU summit at the beginning of his administration. I think that those really were strong signals. Now, my question, I think cyber climate and COVID are exactly right anchors, and there could be a lot that happens uh, with the US Africa policy on those areas. Principle, pragmatic, and personal engagement is exactly what the continent need. I'd like to ask you, what is your vision for US Africa policy? But following on Joe, but again, as I said, I was gonna ask this anyway. I think that really COVID recovery in Africa, um, we could get have so much advantage there. Um, the fact that the US government is the largest uh, foreign aid contributor in the world and 75% of our foreign aid to Africa goes to the health sector, uh, building on the strong capacity that we built there through the PEPFAR program, giving the leading role of our private sector, um, particularly you know, with vaccine development and testing development. There's just a lot we can do and China's dangling some PPE out there and getting great advantage and even vaccines that aren't very effective. And so I just wanna push you again on the point that Joe raised about US leadership on COVID. And right now, some of our positions are actually hurting our companies. For instance, when we say ID now can't be exported to other countries in the world, there's a resentment that comes up. And I know in Africa, they say, so America's just taking care of itself is always and just leaving us, we're last in line. So I think our current position is hurting us. Um, and we have so much capability actually in this country to take strategic, uh, I shouldn't say advantage, but we have a strategic role to play in the world to solve problems that would do just what Joe said, which would build that soft power. Um, so those are that's a bit long-winded to say congratulations on all the great work that you all are already doing. What's your vision for Africa? And specifically, how can we leverage the COVID uh, recovery uh, global approach? Thanks, Chen Dai. Um, let, let me say in, in answer to what I think was a very compelling uh, presentation of both the challenge and the opportunity, we fully recognize that there is an urgent need for the United States to step up to the plate to deliver for the world to end this pandemic and then to help the world recover from this pandemic. Vaccines are part of that. And um, you know our 60 million AstraZeneca is a step, but billions of doses ultimately are needed. And that's going to mean manufacture, logistics, uh, and getting shots in arms. And the United States, over the coming weeks, 
uh, we'll be elaborating uh, a fuller strategy for how we intend to be at the vanguard of helping Africa and the rest of the world uh, both get vaccinated and then uh, bounce back. Um, another piece of the bouncing back, of course, is economic. And um, the United States is fully committed to uh, thinking about the kinds of investments required, not just to build back better in the United States, but to build back better worldwide. Uh, climate, health, digital, uh, gender equity. These are all areas where we are going to look to work with like-minded partners to mobilize both public and private capital, not just for debt, but for equity investments. Um, and we will have more to say to, on that uh, subject in the coming months as well. So between the kinds of economic, big economic moves that we can make uh, and uh, what we can do on the public health front, um, this is going to be a paramount focus of our foreign policy over the course of the next year. Uh, and uh, with, it, with the aim of ending the pandemic, not in 2024, but in 2022. Uh, and we will do everything in our power as we go forward to be able to accomplish that. Great, let's hope we can get there. Um, Jake, I have a conversation, a question for you from Paul Shankman from US News and World Report. Yes, hi, thank you very much for, thanks very much for taking my question. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, does the president believe that he has the authority to order all military members to take the coronavirus vaccine, a coronavirus, a coronavirus vaccine, while it's still under emergency authorization? And does he have any political concerns about ordering something that appears to be so unpopular among some members of the uniformed force? Thank you. I'm just gonna leave it at that's something that uh, the Department of Defense is looking at in consultation with the interagency process uh, and don't have anything to add to, on that subject here today. Great. Sounds good. And we want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to make this the last question. And it's from Bob Hormatz, who, of course, was senior official at the US State Department. Hey, Bob. Hi, how are you? Thanks very much. Hello, Jake. Hi, Bob. Um, on China, you mentioned very early on that China wanted to be preeminent in technology of various sorts. Um, the U.S. has certainly the capability of advancing quite dramatically in areas like 5G, quantum computing, AI. Uh, one of the traditions of American policy is collaboration between the government and the private sector on these things that are dual use. They can be commercially used and they can be of military use. Are there some plans? Of course, the president wants also for us to be preeminent and also to create a lot more domestic jobs. Are there any plans or is there a program uh, whereby we can boost or step up our collaboration between the government and the private sector to leap ahead of China in these several areas? One, it's strategically important and two, economically important, creating a lot of jobs at home. Is this a high priority? And if so, what are the next steps then what can be done about it? Thanks, Bob. Great question. And the answer is emphatically yes. In fact, a central proposition of the American Jobs Plan is uh, to have significant public investment in key areas, clean energy, biotechnology, uh, advanced electronic semiconductors, um, with the goal of mobilizing private sector innovation private sector job creation, uh, and that foundation of basic research, creating whole new industries uh, alongside millions of good paying jobs. Um, that's what the American Jobs Plan is all about. And just as one example, um, a part of the American Jobs Plan is, is focused on, on the semiconductor industry. There's also a bill moving through the Congress now on a bipartisan basis called the CHIPS Act. Uh, and what the CHIPS Act says is the United States government is prepared to step up, not to pick winners and losers, but to make investments in uh, the, fab you know, the fabrication and manufacturing capacity of uh, semiconductors as chips here in the United States. And uh, that it, the government will put skin in the game and the private sector will put skin in the game. And the result will be a combination of good paying union jobs in America, plus uh, 
the security that comes from having a resilient supply chain uh, of these chips. Um, and that is uh, a central part of what we're trying to accomplish um, with the economic strategy of the Biden administration. It goes back to the point I was making before about foreign policy being domestic policy and vice versa. It's why the work of the National Economic Council is so central to the success of our national security strategy. Great, Jake, thank you so much. We'll leave it there and let you go back to your important work. Thank you for sharing with us some of the vast array of issues that are on your plate. Um, for all of you out there in the audience, we wish we could be in person and we have an announcement for you. We're hard at work working on the 2021 Aspen Security Forum. Regretfully, we've decided that in August, it's just too soon for so many of us to be safely together in um, Aspen. So the Security Forum will meet virtually from the 3rd to the 5th of August, but then we are planning an in-person event in November. And we have a great lineup already for those two events. Um, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar of India, the Prime Minister of Singapore, several US cabinet level officials and senior officials. So we look forward to seeing all of you there. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend.